Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to the last tutorial of ISTQB Specialist Automotive Software Tester. As a part of this, we are looking into the sample questions of chapter four, talking about the chapter four that is automotive specific test techniques, which generally covered static and dynamic techniques, which an automotive tester can refer to or apply during the examination, of course. So yes, this is the very last tutorial covering the sample questions of the chapter four, talking about automotive software tester. The very first thing examination pattern, uh, you will be definitely being asked uh, from this chapter almost around uh, a lot of questions, which makes a lot of value to you overall thing. But yes, you will have accountably around seven questions coming from this chapter. So you can see the breakup here where the source of this information is your istqb.org official web page. And uh, you see that some of the terms are coming from K1, then 4.1 will have K2, 4.1.2 will have K3 as well. And major, major share for the four questions are coming from the second part of it, that is dynamic testing. And of course, you can expect two K3 level questions from here, 4.2.5 and 4.2.1. So just make sure that you have a good understandability coming uh, specific to the chapter four. So we have seven questions from this chapter and let's quickly get started with the sample questions. The question number one, which of the following statements regarding MISRA that is Misra C 2012 is true. Remember the very first tutorial which we covered as a part of the Misra 12 technique and we just wanted to understand that how this standard works and what exactly uh, it helps you to at any point of uh, time to determine and it helps you to determine certain standards, which helps to determine how exactly testing can be organized. So here are four options provided to you. A, rules of the category required must not be neglected by the developer, even if he gives a reason. I think that sounds a little different and uh, unreasonable because uh, required guidelines may only be disregarded by the developer if he can provide a compelling reason to that so of course that is possible and uh, that's not a relevant option for us b the binding character of guideline is predefined for every organization now when it comes to predefined of course organizations can intensify the binding character of a rule for themselves so it is not predefined at any point of time how exactly you want to deploy those standards for specific to misra misra c which is specific to the c language uh, which we generally make use of in automotive standards or programming interfaces can definitely be determined within the organization as per the guidelines so it does not has a hard fast code rules uh, determined already to be followed by the organization c rules of the category mandatory should avoid typical coding anomalies yes so that's that's something which is as per the standard if you remember that coding standards help to avoid anomalies of course to reduce the defects much earlier in the life cycle and definitely prevent them from being propagated into design or further into you know next uh, implementation of further codes so typical violation of code standards are part of these anomalies which we generally consider so yes that is what the Mr. C standard will help you do. Uh, but the uh, Mr. guidelines are fully testable by static analysis tool. Uh, I don't think we generally have any specific such tool available in the market as of today that helps you to finally completely capture everything from the point of code review. Like could be a standard or could be about the security vulnerabilities and a lot of such uh, coding issues which you can find. So directives are not fully testable by static analysis tools, which is definitely not possible because you can customize the code. Well, at this point of time, the right answer is C here. Rules of the category mandatory should avoid typical coding anomalies. And yes, that could be very well let you know determined with help of the MSRC 2012 guidelines, which we use in automotive industry. Question number two, we are looking at another typical type of question here and uh, it's a scenario kind of thing. So please have patience there to understand and read the question carefully before you can look at the options. Try to solve your question yourself first and then look at the option to be more confident with your right answer. Question number two, the requirements for a car radio on system level are be given below. After switching it on, the system shows the message welcome for three seconds. In a switched on state, the radio is in one of the states that is active, passive, or in maintenance. And in a switched off state, 
the last state is saved. The moment you turn on, then it retrieves that particular uh, state. In a switched on state, the radio function is engaged by pressing the button radio because you do have different options like aux, Bluetooth, and you know, so on things. So, you know, it engages the uh, radio function only by pressing the button radio. And number four, if the CD function is engaged and no CD is in the drive, the system shows the message no disk. I think that's very, very, very common. And, you know, you don't really have to break your head to understand these scenarios, but obviously to understand the standard or exactly the requirement or the question what they're trying to ask you. So finally, the question, which of the following statements about the given quality criteria for the requirements according to ISO, IEC or IEEE 29148 is true? So we just have to make sure that what exactly is most valid here and uh, what is that we should be taking care of and reviewing a requirement uh, because we are talking about static testing here. So we have four options, of course. A, requirement one is not ver verifiable. B, requirement two is not singular. C, requirement three is inconsistent. D, requirement four is not unambiguous, okay? Please be careful. This is like negative false coming back to the same point. So that means it is ambiguous, okay? So not unambiguous, you know, you need to be very careful with such things. Now, when you talk about such things here, of course, uh, the right answer here, we will discuss that. We talk about, first of all, the terms, the verifiable, whether it can be verified or not. Yes, it is just the three seconds matter. And definitely requirement one can be verified because you can just wait for three seconds on a stopwatch and so you can see that if the welcome message is displayed or not, because everything is very clear that you power on, you see a welcome message, the text is known to you, and the duration is known to you. There's nothing else which you have to do here. Requirement two is not singular. Now, of course, if you'll see that, you know, in switched on state, the radio is in one of the state, right? We have three different states provided to you, but this is not determined, okay? But as per the uh, standard of ISO, IEC, IEEE, and all those things, we generally have to have a requirement as singular because if you have multiple parameters being defined, it must be broken into different sections like 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, but not all the requirements in one line because it becomes you know difficult to uh, measure them at any point of time. So make sure that the requirement has to be singular, not considering different variables. So yeah, that's one of the things. So requirements are the basis here, not the test object. The described technique would also be more uh, review of the requirement. So that becomes typically different. But let's look at C. Requirement 3 is inconsistent. No, nope. that's also not correct. So here we are talking about uh, how exactly this is being inconsistent in terms of like the requirement 3 is not consistent. Uh, of course, it is uh, not true. Because if you look at the switch on this tight uh, function is engaged by pressing the button radio, yes, it is consistent. And if you talk about the D, uh, the test requirements are unambiguous. It is mentioned clearly that it should be considered. So it's not, of course. So the final answer here is B, requirement two is not singular because the requirement two can be split into two partial requirements. And uh, in the one of about them is inner states, when it is switched on and in the other one statement about the switch off state. So two things are being discussed at the same time. Let's look at the question number three. Which of the following statement is not a description of the fault injection test? Of course, now you should look for the one which is not relevant to the fault injection test, which you finally apply as one of the technique for dynamic testing. A, fault injection test insert uh, faults in the behavior of the external component to detect that the system can deal with error in a situation. I think we should recall the definition of fault injection here. That fault injection helps you to uh, feed in a defect and see that how exactly uh, it reverts me when it comes to the, uh, you know, how exactly we need to test it. Because it is seeded purposefully, you know, fault seeding option to see that if the defect can be identified by the test cases or not. So. Yes, fault injection test inserts fault in the behavior of external components to detect that the system can deal with error situation or error handling or recovery scenarios and all. Because generally, uh, your common approach does not test that because you always try with positive scenarios and you always exit the loop. But you don't get into the error handling or 
uh, recovery scenario. So yes, it is true. Uh, we are looking for the faults. B, fault injection test insert faults in internal interfaces. Example as lost messages. Yes, of course, internal or external, both the ways it helps you to test. C, fault injection test inserts fall in the system specification. Example as too low parameters for a required performance. Now, that's a little tricky. If you talk about the statement here, it is absolutely wrong as fault injection tests are not about errors in the requirement. It's about making sure that error handling code which is written for any kind of recovery, if in case the system crashes or it, it does not respond to the request which is sent, then how exactly the user responds to that. So, or like what kind of response the server gives away to the user. So, you know, it's not about basically uh, in the requirements, it's about systems, the software which you're preparing. And the option D, fault injection test inserts fault in the operating unit that shows an internal defects. Of course, that is a relevant statement because we are talking about operating unit which comes as a part of the system. So finally, the right answer here is C, fault injection test insert faults in the system specification, which could be another example of uh, as two low parameters for the required performance. That is not a description for fault injection test. Well, that's all from the sample questions team. But before that, we also have the closure of this session today. We're talking about ISTQB specialist automotive software tester coming to an end. We have covered all the tutorials, all the segments of this entire syllabus, which will definitely help you to prepare well. I hope you have been through all the tutorials to get well prepared for the examination. Now, a quick summary of the entire syllabus. You have 40 questions coming up in the examination and you'll be provided with 60 minutes if you are an English origin country, but for other countries, you will definitely have plus 15 uh, to add more value. And you have four chapters to be covered as a part of the syllabus. Chapter one has three questions. Chapter two, having the major contribution as 18 questions. Chapter three, 12. Chapter four, seven questions respectively, which makes together 40 questions to be answered in 60 minutes. All right, team, so that was all from me on the automotive software tester. Of course, at any point of time, if you should have anything else, feel free to comment below and let me know that how exactly I can help you better. At the end, I would like to wish all of you a very all the best for your preparation on the examination. Make sure that you do well and definitely come back to us and let me know that how was your examination and if you have definitely passed. Even if you fail, please come back and let me know what is that I can do better for you. All right. So that's all from this tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.